things you asked me to talk a bit about was childhood and growing up and where I originate where I originated and I grew up in a, a small town in southwestern Ontario Wingham um, but actually outside that town we I, my father had a farm that had been his father's and his father's before him and uh, it was a wonderful place to grow up I had a sister slightly younger than I was and we spent tremendous amounts of time out of doors um, one of the crucial things that happened, I think, that influenced my life at that point was that when I was 11 years old, there was a barn fire and we lost everything. And my father, who uh, had farmed because his father had before him, made the decision to completely change his life in some ways. And uh, he started taking flying lessons without telling my mother and got a pilot's license and then trained to be a flying instructor. And from the time that happened until he was 75. He taught flying lessons. And it gave both my sister and I the idea that you can really actually change your life at any point. You want to. <laughs> and I think, uh, I think that's been quite true for both of us. Um, when, when I was a child, uh, one of my major influences, I, I think this had a lot to do with what happened later, though I would never recognize it, was that there was a wonderful teenage girl living down the road on the next farm named Alice Monroe. <laughs> who, uh, of course, is a very well-known writer. But uh, she used to come when my parents went out, which was not nearly often enough was from my point of view, and tell us stories. And uh, they were marvelous stories, and she'd go, and then we'd wait and wait until maybe my mother would decide that they should go out for an evening, and she'd come back, and I'd ask her where... Or she'd ask... I would ask her to continue the story. And she'd say, well, where was I? And I would tell her, and then she would carry on. And she gave me this amazing sense of how stories do carry one through life. And I still see her regularly. She's a, a wonderful, dear friend. But I credit her with my interest in stories, really. Um, my mother had grown up in Toronto and had moved to teach in Wingham. And so there was always a sense that I would probably go to university. A lot of the kids in our schools did. We, uh, we went to a one-room school, and then we went to a bigger high school. But it, I was thinking uh, recently that I think it was often girls who went off to school uh, after, after high school because so many of the young fellows in our classes were continuing to do what my father had done and had farms and rob obligations there. But I went to Toronto, and... Uh, in those days, this would sound strange to students now, but the way we registered for courses was to stand in long lines and have pieces of paper passed back and forth. Um, and the general course for arts and humanities that I was enrolled, enrolled in, it was called Social and Philosophical Studies, although we called it Sock and Phil, um, had a list of courses. And I thought I'd recognized the words economics and sociology and political science, but I had really never heard the word anthropology before. And so I thought, well, I'm in the big city. I'm going to sign up for this course. And I had the most wonderful teacher. And I've, I've talked with other people, um, colleagues, who also had him as a first-year teacher. His name was Robert Daly. And he, uh, he was magnificent. They were, in those days, in that program, they put their very best teachers in the first-year courses. And we had no idea how lucky we were. But Robert Daly, first of all, learned all our names. There were 350 students in the class. He would call on us by surname when he wanted us to uh, uh, respond, and he would ask us questions by surname. And he, he, was, he was an amazing man. And he, for me, having grown up in a very small town, the, the material in that course so broadened my understanding of what the world might be like that I decided to major in anthropology. Uh, never forgotten that. Uh, th that beginning, and it was I had a great time at uh, university, enjoyed it very much, but it never really crossed my mind that I would apply for graduate studies. I was happy to get a BA and get a job, and I did, and after two months in a quite structured office uh, situation, I decided that this was not a life that I had been prepared for at all, so I, I left that. And some very good luck followed this. There were, I've had two or three things that really made changes just accidentally. I went to Ottawa because I had some friends there, and someone told me that there was a little institute called the Canadian Research Centre for Anthropology, associated with St. Paul University, which I think, Frederick, you mentioned. Um, and I knew nothing about it, and no one else seemed to, so I went and knocked on the door, and this 
elderly, not elderly, but older gentleman, I think he was probably about 35, met me at the door and invited me to come in, and his name was Jim Lotz. Uh, he's uh, very well known, I think, in the community development world. Um, and Jim talked to me for a while and then said that he thought I should just come and simply work there. They had a beautiful library. It was a large house with a magnificent library. There were students in different rooms doing different projects. He uh, applied for a grant. The Royal Commission on the Status of Women was in place at that time, and Jim Lotz discovered that there really was not much happening in the North, and certainly nothing that had anything to do with Aboriginal women. So he set me reading in that direction, and then uh, sent me to the Yukon. He had worked in the Yukon himself previously, looking at the consequences of moving so-called squatter settlements, um, closing those down in the Yukon, and so he had people there he knew, and uh, he sent me there. I went and stayed at a hostel for women who were coming from surrounding villages to maybe for medical reasons, for various reasons when they had to be in town and couldn't maybe stay in a hotel. And so I met women from all over the Yukon and northern BC. Many of them invited me to come and visit afterward, and that was a really profoundly interesting and very different experience for me. And I decided that what I really wanted to do was to live in the Yukon. I was going to try and find a way to get, a, get work there, and that was my plan. But of course, I really didn't have any skills for those jobs. <laughs> and I went back to Ottawa and with Jim, uh, worked on the, that project. Uh, we, I wrote up a report of the work we'd done and decide, decided to apply for a master's degree at, here at UBC, University of British Columbia, and uh, was accepted. Um, and that was very interesting. That was 1968. And there were a large number of students. I think, they, I think they must have taken in 25 or 30 students. There were a number of students from the US who were protesting the draft and were there. There were students from all over Canada and from various places. And it was a very, very dynamic time to be, be in that department. At that point, it was a really international department as well. I was, one reason I'd applied there was because Harry Hawthorne had recently completed with his colleagues the study of contemporary Indians of Canada, I believe, looking at policies and what the problems were. Um, and so uh, at that point, um, he was one of the people who I, I worked with. Robin Riddington was my advisor. Um, there were people like Michael Ames and several others uh, who were tremendously helpful. And Robin um, eventually, at the end of the year, decided that uh, we, I took this report to him and I said, is there anything we could do with this that I could maybe turn into a master's thesis? And he and this committee sat down with me and they decided, well, you can just basically almost use this as your thesis. You can make some changes and add a few things. And so I actually completed that degree quite quickly. Um, but then I had this problem of how I was going to get back to the Yukon. And that didn't seem to be going well. <laughs> I really didn't have <laughs> skills that were necessary there. Um, but then another uh, thing that happened at that time was we, all of us who were students, lived in uh, rooms uh, throughout the city. And we all, uh, people hitchhiked to school all the time. And so one day I was getting a ride with someone who asked me uh, what I was studying. And I told him, and he said, uh, he gave me a card. He worked at the University of Alaska. His name was Arlen Tussing, and he was an energy economist who was one of the major players in everything that happened with the oil industry. Um, and he, for instance, created the Permanent Fund or was involved in creating the Permanent Fund in Alaska because he did not believe that oil prices would rise forever. But I, was, uh, I wrote to them, um, and they hired me. I didn't really see him much again, but I became involved in a project which... Uh, was an evaluation of cooperatives. The university had several colleagues uh, in political science and other disciplines looking at um, co-ops that were being funded by the US Office of Economic Opportunity, as it was then called. And they needed somebody who would uh, help with field work. Most of them were senior people. and they So I got to travel around Alaska, both the interior and the coast. And this, again, fueled my interest in anthropology and what this might contribute. Um, I was there for a year as a Canadian citizen, and I was warned that I shouldn't try to think I be could become an American by marrying an American, which had never crossed my mind. <laughs> but a year later, I had to leave, so I came down the road and I decided to stop in Whitehorse and stayed there then basically for the next 10 years. So this, is, this really was where I began thinking more about anthropology. I had 
Aboriginal friends who were my own age, who were in the late 60s and early 70s, interested in the things that were happening in the terms of development of land claims, developing strategies, political strategies, and other kinds of things that should be done. And they suggested that a role for a young white woman who was not part of the community that might be useful and might be helpful would be to interview uh, women, their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunts. Uh, they were well read. They were very familiar with the anthropological literature. And they pointed out correctly that there was a great deal about men's hunting practices uh, that had been written by Azim Balixi, by John Honigman, by other people who'd worked in the Yukon, but very little information about women. And so I set out to, uh, on that kind of project with women who were all very interested and agreed that this is what we should be doing. Uh, we applied for little bits of money from the National Museum and from uh, Canada Council and actually got some funding for themselves and for me. And we started working on life stories. And what became clear to me after a short period of time was that my idea of life story was quite different from theirs. And I felt we had a responsibility to these families and to my friends to make a life story that fit what they had been thinking of. And the women would basically, when I asked my question, say, sure, fine, later, but first write down the story of the boy who stayed with fish or uh, the girl who married the stars or what came to be, I came to understand, very foundational stories that they saw as important, important reference points to which they could point when they were talking about life experiences and how one should conduct a life successfully. So nine or ten of women worked on those booklets. We printed them up on Gestetners, a, an ancient form of reprodu reproduction <laughs> before photocopy machines, and those booklets went to families. And more and more, I became interested in this kind of project and where this this might 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 go. Um, with what we what we did, we we produced booklets for families, but we also produced booklets, and I'll point out to some of the, point some of them out later, uh, for schools because at that point there were teachers and educational uh, people generally interested in material in the schools. And these women really felt strongly that their life stories were something that could be part of the curriculum, whether social studies or history or literature, whatever. So um, the, a number of booklets were produced and those I think were, uh, I was tremendously impressed by the fact that teachers wanted to use those in classes, in, in different kinds of classes. And women were more than happy to be invited in as, as speakers. Um, there, this went on for a number of years. Um, it, the broader context, too, at that point was the uh, Mackenzie Valley Pipeline was being considered. The Alaska Vi Valley Pipeline was, uh, Alaska Highway Pipeline, excuse me, was being considered as well. And there were, I was learning more about the history of the place and the impact of things like not just the gold rush, but also the Alaska Highway and what that had done uh, to families in different, different ways. Women consistently talked about how difficult it had been for men to have, when the highway went through, it coincided with a drop in fur prices, and so men were often put in a situation where they weren't able to continue hunting and trapping in the way they had. Families were in communities, new communities, and this was terrifically difficult for a lot of people, and government officials tended to deal with men uh, because they saw that as, uh, they saw them as the heads of household. So there was a lot of discussion about this too that worked into um, the booklets that they were, were preparing. Um, in the middle of all this, probably about 1974 or 75, a brilliant young linguist named John Ritter <laughs> Uh, also came to town. Joan was uh, a student at MIT as a, in the linguistics PhD program at that point and came to the north and worked in Fort McPherson and then decided that, uh, must have had an experience similar to mine, he decided that he didn't want to do academic work, particularly at the university. He wanted to stay in the Yukon. Um, he learned to speak languages uh, faster than anyone had ever experienced from in the Aboriginal community, and he set up something called the Yukon Native Language Center, um, which we, one of the key people there was a woman named Gertie Tom, who taught us both a lot about her language, and then John continued to do uh, lin linguistic programs and work with elders, and I just kept doing the kind of work that I had been. Um, so that, that continued uh, on for a while, um, for, for many years, really, um, until about... 
Uh, well, th there was one other intervention that you asked about. I, in 1979, well, I didn't want to do real uh, graduate work at an extended level. I did decide to go to Cambridge to do a one-year project um, with the, with, at Cambridge University at the Scott Polar Research Institute. They had a program which was called a diploma program, and it was rather like a master's degree. Um, you wrote a thesis, and you, um, you also took a lot of courses about the nor circumpolar north, and that was a fantastic experience as well. But again, with the thesis, um, which I can come back to later, I, that I also had an opportunity to work on things that had come up in the stories these women had told that I didn't really understand. Specifically, um, there were glaciers that turned up in their stories, and these women lived nowhere near glaciers that I knew of, and I got very interested in questions about local knowledge and talking with scientists as well as people in communities about what they knew about, about landscape. So I, I, I decided to apply again to UBC, to the University of British Columbia, to, uh, to do a PhD, partly because it was nearby, partly because I knew the faculty members there, and uh, it seemed like a, a good, very good situation to be in. And I felt very fortunate with the people I was able to work with. Um, the, the key things that I was interested in at that point um, were... In, in anthropology, uh, I think you were asking about theoretical influences, but the real the real interest I had were was two things. One in the whole notion of collaboration with communities. It seemed to me that the women I was working with were changing the questions that I might have asked if I'd been a student very directly and saying, "This is where we'll go, and then we'll come back to your questions, maybe." Um, and so uh, collaboration was one issue. And I, I remember having a, a conversation with uh, Martin Silverman, who is a wonderful professor we had. He taught us the history of theory and was one of the best courses any of us had ever had. We all agreed. But I remember raising this question with him, and he raised an eyebrow and said that for someone who'd grown up in the post-war era, collaboration was not exactly a term that would seem to be quite appropriate. But of course, it has become part of the language now. And I really did feel that, that the input and the direction those women gave me changed the way I saw everything about the work we were doing. Um, and I was also interested in the work that was being written by many people, James Clifford certainly comes to mind, about uh, ethnographic writing um, and different ways of, that written, uh, ethnographies could be written. And I think there's a longer history of this, but it was his work that made me start thinking about, about quite, a, uh, quite a bit about this. Um, it, we, if, we, if we follow the questions of our interlocutors, I think we do get to very different places. Uh, the key people there, again, Robin was my advisor, a uh, terrific person to work with. Um, I was also uh, very interested in people who, uh, some of the other people you've interviewed or are interviewing, um, Michael Ash, uh, Harvey Fight, uh, people who, who had written about the North and written about Arctic and subarctic, Azen Belixi, uh, Adrian Tanner had just written his uh, master's thesis in, in the Yukon, so there was a there was a lot of um, there were a lot of people I was really interested in reading during those years. Catherine McClellan, who was at the University of Wisconsin, was possibly the person whose work influenced me most because she had begun working do, uh, doing ethnography in the Yukon in the 1940s and was still doing this right through the rest of her life and. Uh, she was a. She has a tremendous. Um, people remember her very well in the Yukon, and she was also a tremendous influence for me. Um, the thing that I found about uh, I really was interested in ethnography, particularly because it seemed to me that it it made it, ethnography well written does provide the possibility of helping us to fight the tendency to live within our own worldviews, which I think is a, I think it was a problem then and I think it's a huge problem now. And so that was, that was sort of the emphasis of my, uh, my, my interest in, in uh, anthropology at that point. Um, when I tried to, when I was writing my dissertation, I remember we had a long discussion about this because I felt that in this context, I really needed to be able to draw in the stories of the women who had told me these stories in their own words, in their own, in that dissertation. And that's not quite what happens in dissertations usually. So they allowed me finally, after much discussion, to have a two volume dissertation, one where I did the theoretical work and the overview, and another that had the women's stories uh, as they had told them, uh, three of the women particularly, Mrs. Angela Sidney, Mrs. Annie Ned, and Mrs. Kitty Smith. 
uh, in that volume. And that volume, of course, is probably much more valuable than my dissertation ever was, in my view, for the, for the time. Um, I continued to go back to the Yukon every summer, always uh, since then. Uh, I, last year was the first summer that I wasn't able to get to the Yukon for a period of time, but we continued working together over the years. And uh, in the eventually we produced, well, in 1990, the book Life Lived Like a Story, which was a, we called it a collaborative ethnography with four authors. Um, and it, it was it, it was different from the dissertation, but it it got to the it got to the issues of what kinds of questions women were raising about what's important. What are the fundamental stories you need to in order to be able to live life fully, and how do these stories benefit younger people now? They kept making the point these are not stories from the past. They are treated as stories from the past, but actually they're they're quite critical um, as we go ahead. Uh, so that book I was very happy to be able to work on with those women and uh, their families. Um, I started uh, teaching actually in, uh, right after my PhD as a sessional lecturer for, in 1988. Uh, and, uh, I got a, and, that was, and that was really a good experience for me because it gave me a chance to really think about teaching and I did enjoy teaching enormously at UBC. Uh, it was 1990 when I was actually hired in a tenure track position. Um, and again, uh, I, I taught a number of courses. In those days, we didn't have specific courses each. We all traded around, so I, I, I taught many different courses, but I particularly enjoyed ones on oral tradition, on material culture, on history of anthropology, and uh, those kinds of courses. I, I found the students there Terrific. We had, it was a different time, and I'm not quite sure how this works now, but we, office hours were tremendously important. I did, following Robert Daly, get to know the names of almost all my students. And that, of course, is much more difficult now in an age when office hours are probably aren't as important and people do work much more by um, email exchanges. But uh, what I found best about teaching, I think, was the questions that students brought to our discussions, both undergraduate and graduate questions. Um, and there, I've maintained long and close relationships with a, a number of, of people from those years. Um, the history of anthropology uh, was, it was, you asked about the history of anthropology in the department, and I think that by that point, there was a stronger emphasis on uh, ca Canadian anthropology than there had been maybe years earlier, I'm not sure. Uh, Michael Q., uh, was doing very interesting work. Robin, of course, Robin Riddington. There were a number of people working uh, there at, at that point. And uh, one of the really important things that happened at UBC about that time, I think, was the initiation of the First Nations House of Learning because there were increasing numbers of Indigenous students coming. There was not yet a program in Indigenous Studies, which there is now an excellent program, but a lot of those students were coming to anthropology classes and. For me, it was really important that they get an experience that made this worthwhile for them during those years. Um, and I spent a lot of time uh, at the First Nations House of Learning as well. Um, I learned what I learned about Canadian anthropology. I think I learned directly from reading uh, these work by people in working with Athabascan and Algonquian communities. Um, CASCA was tremendously important, the Canadian Association for uh, Canadian Anthropology Society. It changed its name a couple of times, I think. And I went as a student, and I went, uh, encouraged my students to go, and I went regularly during uh, the years that I was teaching and met a lot of people working, particularly in the eastern subarctic. Um, that was, um, I think, uh, I think retrospectively, I began to think that maybe one of the reasons I was hired at UBC was certainly because my work fit the interests of people there, but also possibly because I was Canadian. It wasn't quite clear uh, how all these things were working at the time, but the, um, it was a joint sociology and anthropology department and, and a very wonderful group of people to work with for years. Um, I did uh, this. It, it is interesting. It seems like a short time. I, I taught at UBC for 13 years, and then I took early retirement partly because I wanted to still continue to be able to do work on projects in the Yukon and, and did continue to do so. Um, 
there were a lot of things happening. The administrative demands were increasing, and I just felt that because I'd started so late, I wasn't ready to give up research yet. Uh, so I, that was one of the reasons I left um, early. Um, one of the number of projects that happened subsequently uh, were, um, let's see, how to frame these. There, there were, uh, I've worked with a native language project since I left, uh, initially helping a couple of younger women who were fluent in their own languages put together booklets about families and family histories in their languages, and that was really rewarding. Um, I became very interested in the work of a young man who came to the Yukon in 1890, uh, complex circumstances, uh, but he was surprisingly interested for a person in that time uh, of uh, what was happening in local communities or in, in indigenous communities. He wrote down, particularly he wrote down place names in native languages as he passed through and was very eager to do this and eager to, uh, he took, he made sketches of people that people now recognize years later or have been recognized. Um, he, it was, it was a kind of ethnography. He was not there for very long, for two summers, but uh, the La Native Language Center suggested that we do uh, uh, some work on his his research and make that available more recently. So we've just completed a book not too long ago on his travels on the Alsek River in the Yukon and the descriptions of communities there. Um, there, you also asked about uh, some of the other projects, Catherine McClellan who is, really was a, a very senior anthropologist and I think has done a, the classic work on anthropology in the Yukon Territory, uh, working there from the 1940s until the 1980s, uh, asked me late in her life whether I'd come and help her work uh, getting her papers to the National Museum of Canada, which she felt that, where she felt they should go. But also we decided um, putting together some books of the stories that she had recorded that she'd never actually been able to publish because those stories continue to become relevant in communities. So we put together three volumes of, of those narratives, which one from Te a volume from Teslin, one from Carcross, Tagish First Nation, and another one from stories from Champagne Asiac First Nation. And those, I think, have been also really valuable in the community. Wonderful working with her doing this. And I think that um, her, her materials are now in the National Museum and uh, available with certain kinds of restrictions over the next, next few years. It's an issue, I think, that anthropologists need to think more about what we're going to do with all those notes we have uh, when, some, when, we, when we get older. So I've thought about that a lot myself recently.